Diana. Yeah, thank you, Ruthann, and I'm um, glad to see that we're recording. So welcome, and I want to say a special welcome to the folks that um, are going to be joining the discernment group that's coming forward, starting from this class, and others are welcome to join that as well. So this is a class on discernment, uh, or the practice of involving the design, divine in our decision making, large and small, big decisions and small decisions. I am the ministry, I am your ministry leader of discernment, and I've been that in that role since uh, 2012. And I've taught discernment classes over the years. I think some of you actually have already attended <laughs> this class, so there will be some repeat. Um, I've also just personally engaged in many long periods of deep, dis deep discernment. And I use these techniques almost, um, almost every day in my profession as a board certified coach. I work with people going through personal transformation and also for clergy leaders. And as Ruthann mentioned, I've just been elected as the chair on the commission on ministry um, for our diocese, which is the group of people that sort of shepherds those who are feeling a call to ordained ministry um, over, over the period of time and, and making decisions about that. So honestly, I just love teaching and talking about discernment. So I'm super happy that you're here joining us today. So my, um, it will be helpful for you to have pen and paper for some of the exercises that we'll try together. So if you have something handy, I'll just be asking you to take a few notes on some of these things. So um, if you're like me, some days you wish you had a direct line to God asking what to do in our decisions in our lives. And unfortunately, we don't all get angels like Mary did, giving us big news about change that um, God might be calling us into. That said, I really firmly believe that we can kind of put ourselves in the way of God, asking for direction and help as we try to be a partner in building the kingdom of God or the reign of God. I'm going to open with a little prayer um, from, which is a scripture passage from Philippians. So just take a breath. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So today we're going to talk about the practices, and since I only have 45 minutes instead of an hour, we probably won't get to the framework of discernment, um, but we're going to talk about the practices that allows us to hear God's direction as we navigate our lives. And so this is a fairly surface dip into this topic, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of an overview. In addition to teaching these discernment classes periodically, as I mentioned, I also lead discernment groups at Epiphany for people who are considering or sort of feeling prompted to some kind of change or life transition, and they want a deeper dive into these contacts. So the 2021 discernment group is going to be starting um, on Sunday afternoons from four to six, starting January 24th, and meeting about every one to two weeks um, through March, and it possibly into April, depending on kind of how the group goes. goes. There is some room in this group. Um, there will be another group this year, um, if you're interested, especially as the pandemic comes to a close, we're just sort of looking out and expecting that um, as our life gets back to normal, whatever that is, the new normal, that there will be some um, people that are thinking about big change. Um, this is a practical structured place to, the groups are a practical structured place to walk with others through a variety of tools and techniques, some of which I touch on today, to gain greater insight into themselves and the choices before them and, and get a clearer sense of call from God. So let's start with what I mean about despite discernment. In Advent and in Epiphany, many of the stories we heard involved people who were kind of listening to God and following the prompting of God and or the Holy Spirit. But they used their own resources too, right? The Magi used science as well as their own call in their hearts, right? And at much less grand a scale than the Magi, we can do the same thing, seeking to listen to God, using our gifts to make choices and decisions that lead towards greater peace and love or joy, in small ways and large, like lead us into that, what God is calling, Jesus is calling us into. Frederick Buchner has the best line for discernment. He has this great quote, which actually I'm gonna copy into the chat as well. He said, Frederick Buchner says, the place God calls you is where your deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger. So I'm going to say that again. 
Uh, actually, I'm going to try and copy it into chat. I'm having a hard time doing that. Hold on one second. I want, I really want you to hear this quote. Um, oh, that's because I messed up. Okay, here we go. Copy. I'm going to read it again once I paste it into the chat. The place God calls you is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And I want to say thank you to Barbie to remind me to speak more slowly. <laughs> so I will do that. Yes. <laughs> so discernment is figuring out where that place is, where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet, especially on, on the big decisions. It's about working to hear what to do or decide, which is true and real and has a sense of being divinely inspired instead of decisions or choices that might be generated by human fear or greed or pride. And I wanna say everybody, myself included, has made decisions sometimes because we wanna save face in, in a way that allows us to save face or because we were too afraid or some other reason, right? That was not necessarily a reason leading the world and ourselves and our families and our life into joy, love and peace. Discernment is often slow and sometimes it's muddy and sometimes frustrating and difficult, but I wanna to say totally worth it. When I look back on my life, the choices I've made with a discernment lens have always, always worked out for the best. And what's so interesting about it is that when you're using that discernment focus, when you're thinking about what God is calling you to, there's often very positive unintended consequences that you could never have predicted, right? So it's almost like, you know, it's, it, you, it's, it's almost like a beautiful ripple effect or ramifications that happen. I will say that it can be difficult to engage God in the midst of our decisions, not because it's not our society's natural practice, right? We're told by our broader society in the United States that we need to be in control of our destiny, right? And even if we're in the middle of a choice that we do have some control or did have some control, often other people are involved. So it feels complicated and messy. And honestly, our self-image is often at stake, right? So I was the executive director of a nonprofit I had started and I'd been there for about five years and it gotten large and I didn't like it anymore. Deep in my heart, I didn't love it. Um, but, how, but if I left, then you know, who would I be if I wasn't the executive director of Sound Child Care Solutions, right? And, you know, that is not a great reason to stay in a job because you're worried about your identity afterwards, right? So it's, it's that whole idea of needing to be really intentional in order to actually engage God in decision making and let some of those other things go, listen for God more clearly than these other human things, the fear or the self-image or whatever it is. So we're gonna do a little quick exercise here. I'm going to ask you a question slowly. <laughs> and I want you to remember the first image that comes to mind when I ask the question, right? What flashes into your mind at the very first, right? You might have other images that follow, but I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you to do a visual, almost like a visualization. And I want you to think of what, I want you to hold in your memory what was the first image that you saw? Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. All right, perfect. What does God look like? What does God look like? All right, so don't think too much about it now. Just hold in your mind. Remember, what was your very first image? Hold that in the one side. On the other side, what I want you to do is compare that to what I would call your lived theology. So what, in other words, what do you actually think or actually feel who God really is? So does your image, is your first flash image match your understanding, your more mature Christian understanding of who God actually is? Now, some of us, and originally when I first did this exercise many years ago, I did visualize somebody looking a little bit like Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings, right? Or a grandfather with a big beard, you know, sitting on a sitting on the on the throne, a little stern looking, maybe with a with a staff, you know, ready to hit me if I did the wrong thing, right? And so 
it, it, but that is not my image of God right now, right? I, I had that lingering uh, sense of a judging God. I put, I would put the word judging on that image. So I think there is a way, if you have an image, if you had an image of God that didn't match your current understanding of who God is now and how God works and walks in the world with you, you, you might need to do some degree, I would call it even healing of your image of God before true discernment can begin. So, because if we're going to find that place of greatest joy, like the place that God calls us to of love and peace of joy, we need to begin with a context. And the context that supports discernment is that God truly and deeply and abundantly loves you, each of you, everyone on this call, everyone in the world, right? So the best discernment begins with being in touch with how much God loves you. And here's why it's important for discernment. If we come to discernment with a foundation idea that God is a judging God, and you have to make up for what you haven't already done or atone for something you did wrong, you'll get to a very different place than if you begin with the idea that God loves you and God has created you to be your very best you, your very best self, right? So if you're trying to make up, you're gonna think something really different than if you're just like, wow, who I am and the gifts God gave me, this is who God created me to be. And I am going to be, and, and in that sense of love and, and, and um, um, authenticity, you're going to make a really different choice than if you're trying to like make up for what happened in the past. Does that make sense? Can I get some nods or some, some, th it, this is the hard thing about training in, <laughs> in Zoom is that I'm like, all right, does that make sense? This is a really important, um, this is actually a really important concept and I want you to hold it. So so I, of course, the best is not the best you is not um, the most stuff or the greatest achievement, but it's where your unique gifts are allowed to flourish, right? It all starts with love. We as Christians, our deepest underlying value, according to Jesus is love, right? From love, by love, of love, 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 right? And if we can't ground ourselves in love, we can't make choices in love that lead us to those places where our best self meets the world's needs. So in a funny kind of way, discernment is really the question, what loving am I made for? What loving am I made for? We are part of one great gigantic love story. And discernment of pro is the process of deciding how you are going to participate in that love story every day or for something that you might be considering as a big change in your life. How am I drawn by love? How am I motivated by love? That's, those are the questions, right? So let's do another exercise. I want you to, again, have that pen and paper ready, but put it down for right now. And I want you to um, relax in your chair. Put your arms, arms or legs down, feel your body in the seat, feel your feet on the floor. Just think for a second, take a couple breaths. And I want you to imagine, you can turn off your video if you want to. I want you to imagine that God's love is pouring into you and through you. So the love of God is pouring down through your head, throughout your whole body, out your arms, out your feet. God is with you and you are just in the presence of his deep and profound love. Just sit with that for a minute. Maybe it's beautiful light golden light filling your whole being. I'm going to read a passage now from Psalm 139. O Lord, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. 
You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You are with me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from, my, from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes behold my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. I come to the end. I am still with you. Amen. Now take a few more breaths and when you're ready, I'd like you to note down what came to you as I read the Psalm. Any thoughts or feelings or images? Just take a second. You might wanna turn your camera back on again, if you'd like. Does anyone feel a little more refreshed? A little more loved? Yeah, a little more and warm. This is the place from which to discern where you are right now, where you're feeling rested in God's love, deeply rested in God's love. This is the place to get to as you're pondering, uh, whatever it is, whatever change you're considering. Now, as you walk through your life, you're not always going to feel that love, right? And if I'm only dependent on my feelings of God's love, it might be hard, right? Because I might have some internal blockages to that in some areas or some ways, or maybe just some days when I'm wrapped up in pain or stress or grief or some old emotional tape. The question is about your belief that lies believe it, beneath it and whether you choose to live out of that belief, right? Love needs to be expressed and that's the choice. We do good things, not because we're supposed to, like maybe there's a little bit of that, but the, but the truest discernment comes out when we are doing things because it just spills out of us. We like can't help it because we're participating in that deep and abiding and abundant love. If we choose to believe in love and act from that place of love, it's also easier to cope with those uh, other voices in our ear that might be self-critical or judgmental, right? We can, we can distinguish what is a God-like loving voice in our ear, that critical voice, and what is not. <laughs> what is not, I call it God, the God voice and the not God voice, right? I, um, discernment is, so does that kind of make sense? You're starting from that place of the, the love abundantly filling, spilling out of you, right? That's where you should be aiming for here. 
I choose to believe in love, not necessarily because I always feel it, because I, but because I choose it. And so then I act from that wellspring that comes out. The corollary to this is that discernment is not about a set of external standards and measuring our decisions against them. Discernment is about finding that most authentic self inside of you, right? It's not based on the judgments of what others of others or what you think you should be doing according to some set of externally uh, defined values. No matter how wonderful those values are, they might be amazing, wonderful values, right? But if it's not you, it's not gonna help, <laughs> right? It's not, I had, a, I had a good friend a long time ago who um, decided she graduated from college and she decided that she was going to work, she was going to choose the most serious problem that, she, that, that, that there was in the world. And she decided hunger was it. And then she decided that in her environment, the most, the most powerful thing she could do to address hunger is to work at a food bank. So she got a job at a food bank and she, um, and she, she worked really hard and she um, wanted to make a really big difference and she was, and she was miserable. It was not the right fit for her, even though she chose it out of this externally defined values. What she was kind of feeling a longing to do was design environments. But she had this external set of values that made her think that designing environments was actually not of like good enough or not like valuable enough in the world, right? But eventually what she did was she left, she quit the food bank job, even if she was doing good work there, she was miserable. And she's now creating these beautiful environments for people that allow others to flourish and, and make a difference in the world, right? So it's, it's finding that authentic self, that authentic piece in there. So uh, that makes you the most effective because we don't know what a difference, we can't tell what a difference she has now made in people's lives by creating this beautiful environment, these beautiful environments that allowed them to be more effective, maybe at solving the world hunger, right? Who knows, right? So you gotta be in that place that God is actually calling you to, not to some idea or, set, or outside set of standards. So this brings me to a wonderful take on discernment from one of Dwight, from one of Dwight's early sermons at Epiphany. It was about the it was a sermon about the transfiguration. And I remember where Jesus goes up to the mountaintop and Peter and James and John see him talking to God and Moses and Elijah and all their clothes turn a dazzling white and his face is a dazzling white to Jesus face. And here's the excerpt from Dwight's sermon. What if the transfiguration is not about Jesus's divinity at all. What if it is about his humanity? What if it is about the fact that at every decision point, at every fork in the road, Jesus chooses, like any person, which direction to take? What if he, like you and I could, ask the question, how does my direction reflect God's greatest hope for my life? What if the transfiguration is about human choices decided in here that are magnified out there in the world? Is it possible that if the inside matches the outside, there is radiance, a powerful, beautiful radiance that expresses the greatest possibility for individual humanity, the greatest possibility for you and for me? The soul finds its greatest adventure wherever the soul is set. Maybe that adventure is in line at the grocery store or coaching a team or sitting in the lobby at Park Shore saying good morning to everyone who passes by. Maybe the soul finds its greatest adventure in the carpool or at the conference table or pulling weeds. Do I dare risk being as great as God designed me to be? Do I dare say the words that are as true as God loves me? Do I dare? No one can answer that question for you. I can only ask this question of you. Will you dare to climb to the pinnacle of your possibility? to be as beautiful as you are and as powerful as God created you to be. I love that idea of daring, right? It's, it isn't easy sometimes to be our full authentic self. There is some daring involved here, right? 
and I will say the pinnacle of your possibility sounds a little grand, right? <laughs> like that's it's kind of a big thing, right? And, but it's really discernment is walking on that path to find the place where you feel the most alive, the times when you're giving and receiving the most love, the most joy. The most joy. So it is about love and it's about finding and acting from our most authentic self. So the question is, what do you do for discernment? I, I love the practical thing about discernment. So let's talk a little bit. Let's shift gears now and talk a little bit. Actually, let me pause. Are there any questions about that so far? You just can unmute and answer and ask them. All right. I don't see anybody. I don't see anybody trying to unmute. Okay. I'm just looking at the list. All right. Great. So, so how do we actually get to this path of discernment? So the first step is asking for help, right? The first step is inviting God in and explicitly asking for guidance. And I want to say it's not a one-time thing. <laughs> it's about asking God for guidance over and over and over again. Because rarely does God tap us on the shoulder like God did with Mary, right? We have to engage in the relationship. We have to open the door. We have to ask. And what that means is setting aside time for regular, ongoing, actual listening to God. Whatever that looks like for you, like everybody's going to have a different thing. Some people, it's just in a sitting in, a, in their chair praying. For others, maybe it's when you're working in your garden or when you're running. Um, it, it's it, it's it's your own thing, but you got to set aside that time, and in that time, it does need to be quiet. There has to be not anything else in your ears, right? It's not not while you're listening to music or um, while the kids are screaming outside the door. Um, your soul is like a wild animal, right? Do you, I don't know if any of you have ever read Parker Palmer. I love him. He's a great, he has a great book on discernment, actually. Um, and what he talks about is if the, the soul is kind of like a wild animal in the forest, like a deer, like coming out in the forest. And if you're like a two-year-old and go crashing through the forest yelling for the deer, come on, deer, come on out, right? The, the deer is not going to come out, right? The deer is going to come out when you're sitting on the sitting on the ground, leaning up against a, a tree um, and being really quiet. And then the deer is more likely to come out, right? So it needs quiet. The other really essential element is journaling or recording somehow what it is that you hear. Because we all hear things over the course of our day. And unless you write them down, um, or note them in some way, you're not going to, you're not going to retain them. So the first step is writing it down. And then the second step is reflecting on what it is that you heard. What does it mean? Is it actually authentic to you? Does it feel divine? Does it feel like something that comes from a place of love and peace and joy? Throughout the process of discernment, it is really important to be kind to yourself and to be aware of your inner critical voice. If you're being called into something that you don't think you can do, which happens, has happened to me, um, you've got to let go of that voice that says, you can never do that. Like there, there's, we all have those negative critical voices in our heads, right? And you gotta be kind to yourself and you gotta interrupt that, that, um, that voice, right? Because there's a prayer that I say um, uh, every week in my daily prayer uh, book, which is something like, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, like because of you're with God, God can create in you more than you can possibly imagine, right? Do you remember that prayer? More than you can possibly expect or imagine. And so that is true. And we can believe in that and rest in that and silence our critical voice. Now, sometimes you might have a nudge or a pull or an idea that just keeps coming back, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. So discernment is also paying attention to your life. What doors are opening? What doors are closing? It's noticing what you experience when you take steps toward and away from various decisions. So where's the energy kind of flowing in your life? And where are resources being dropped in your path? Sometimes it's also about what doors are closing, right? Like what resources are being pulled away. So you might feel like you wanted to do something, but you know, like you were thinking, I need to be a, I'm being called to be a lawyer, um, and then you don't get into law school. <laughs> so, okay, what does that mean, right? Like, what is that? What door closed there? What and what does that actually mean? And maybe it means you didn't apply to the right law school, and you're still being called to be a lawyer. Or maybe it means you're not being called to be a lawyer, right? So I think this is the thing to really try and understand and look at the experiences of your life 
and sort of read them and understand what what it mean, what the things that are happening means for what God is calling you to do. Discernment is iterative, right? So if you're here, if I'm here, I'm seeing the world from a certain perspective, right? And if I'm being called over here and take a step over here, I am now suddenly seeing things that were almost behind me before over here. I have a different view, right? I have a different view and I have a different perspective. And so that iteration is really, really important. Community also really helps with discernment. Um, a discernment group like we're starting or the members of, or people in your family or your friends, they can help you see yourself more clearly. They can help you be brave. They can hold you accountable for staying in the process of, a, of a discernment and maybe help you with obstacles. So I will say it's uh, very hard to distinguish your human will from God's call, right? I was so sure that I was being called to start another school. I had started a school, the schools and that when I was the ED role and I loved the start. And I was sure that I was being called to start another school. And then my big partner stepped out, dropped out all of a sudden. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am clearly not being called to start a school because I was at the end of my startup money. And I, and so it just wasn't gonna happen, right? So I, so, I always encourage people to seek ways to confirm what they think they're hearing, right? I, I learned a huge amount out of this partner dropping and, it, and, it, and the dropping out led me to really surrender myself to God in a way that I had never before, which led to lots of beautiful and wonderful things. So it was the right thing that happened for me. But I think it's really important. It does happen sometimes that what we think we're being called to is actually not what we're being called to. And so, You've got to try different ways to ask God the same question. You've got to experiment maybe with new spiritual practices, trying out, maybe try out some steps towards the decision that you're pondering, right? It is the case that often the decision you're discerning will morph. I had a person in a discernment group who was a mom who was heading back to work and she was trying to figure out, did she want to go back to her regular job or did she want to do something different? She knew this was kind of a turning point for her. And the more she was trying to discern this idea of the job, her kids kept coming, her children kept coming back up. And she was like, you know, maybe this is not, and she, because she kind of got to the place where she's like, you know, this is not about my job. I'm trying to discern what kind of mom I want to be. And that was very helpful for her to realize it was not about the job, even though she felt like it was originally. It, the decision morphed, right? The thing that she was being called about, the thing she was discerning changed. And that happens. So there's a very powerful discernment exercise called the examine developed by St. Ignatius. Some of you, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the examine or tried it before. Okay, so not everybody, but some people. All right. So it's uh, St. Ignatius was a 16th century saint who um, discovered that by being attentive to the, to the patterns of his life, he noticed and discovered that some things in his day, as he walked through his day, drew him away from peace and love and joy, while other things drew him toward it and towards peace and love and joy. And so by noticing these patterns over time, he could draw closer towards those things that brought him love and peace and joy and kind of let go of the things that didn't do that. And he had to let go of some things that he thought he loved, like I did with my organization. I thought I loved it, but it really wasn't the right thing for me anymore. As new leadership was needed to, be, to help it flourish to the next degree. So these, you can do this. You can do this same thing. So he developed, uh, St. Ignatius developed this prayer, basically, called prayer process called the examine. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to try it out. I'm going to walk you through the examine right now. So um, again, have that pen and paper available, but, um, but go ahead and put it down right now. Get yourself comfortable in the chair. Do whatever makes you feel sort of centered and reflective. You might wanna turn off your camera or show it towards a different place in your, um, in your room where you are right now. And I want you to begin by taking a few deep breaths all the way down to the bottom of your toes through your belly and your chest. Breathe in, create some space and breathe out, release. Place your hand on your heart and acknowledge God's presence, the God who loves you unconditionally. Just close your eyes, breathe in that love.
and ask Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit, however you understand God, to bring to your heart the moment yesterday for which you are most grateful, where you felt the most sense of love and peace and joy. If you could relive one moment, what would that be? Just think back on your day. Find that moment. I want you to just take a minute and bask in the remembrance of the life that you experienced in that moment. Now I want you to ask God to bring to your heart the moment yesterday for which you are least grateful. When were you least able to give or receive love? Where did you feel depleted or kind of tangled up? Ask yourself what was said or done in that moment that made it so difficult. Just be with that moment without trying to change or fix it in any way. You may wish to breathe gently into that place, both tending to it and experiencing release or forgiveness in the light of God's love. Now remember that our God does forgive us for all things. If there's something you wanna ask forgiveness for, go ahead and do that now. Whatever you're sorry about, if there is anything. And now close by giving thanks for whatever you have experienced. What, what grace would you like to ask for as you close this time of reflection on your day yesterday? When you're ready, open your eyes and take a few notes, just even a phrase or a short sentence about what was that point of giving and receiving the most love, the, the moment, the thing you were most grateful for and the thing you were least grateful for. When you're finished, go ahead and turn your camera back on if you haven't already. So it turns out, I'm gonna wait one more second. Can the people in the discernment group, when you're ready, can you turn the camera back on, please? Great, thank you so much, perfect. Um, so, it turns out that if you do the examine every day for like six weeks, you will discover, this, I just wanna say, I, I promise you, you will discover very important things about your life. It turns out that um, that writing down, it, it, and I should say, if you do it every day and especially write something down, even if it's just a short phrase. Um, I have used this thing, used this examine over time periodically. And it is extremely helpful for discernment and just living a healthy life. Um, you know, it's, it, it really, the patterns that you discover by looking back can lead you to very deep insights about the life, life that you have and the life that you wanna have. I wanna say that for those of you who are gonna be in the discernment group, I wanna encourage you to begin doing this now um, and just have a couple of weeks on it before we actually start our group. It's gonna be really helpful to you, I'm sure. 
All right, so we have about five minutes left, and I just want to say that um, I'm going to run through quite rapidly, <laughs> not speaking fast, but I'm going to sort of skim through prayerful practices that people have found to be very helpful for discernment. Um, and we're going to go into all these in a lot of detail in the group, but just today I want you to know, of course, prayer is the obvious thing in meditation. People also find structured scripture reading to be very helpful. I do fixed hour prayer, which is one of the uh, uh, spiritual disciplines. And um, so I pray four times a day, usually, always three times a day. Usually I get, get to four. And I set my alarm um, for noonday prayer and evening prayer because when I'm in the middle of my day, it's harder to stop and pray. Morning and evening, morning and night, I usually do all right. And I cannot tell you how powerful it is to read a little piece of scripture in the middle of the day. I almost always find something that really helps me from a discernment standpoint. Centering prayer is really common and there's centering prayer groups in, uh, around Seattle you can join. Physical prayer, I wanna just really lift up physical prayer. A lot of people think that the only thing that's actual like real prayer is sitting in a chair. It is not. Walking meditation, walking prayer is helpful, labyrinth. Um, it really depends a lot on your intention, right? If you intend for your yoga session or your running or your run or your swim or your garden time to be a prayerful experience, it will be, right? Um, and so it, that physical kind of thing is really important. Singing and chanting is another thing that people find. There's Tizé, uh, the brothers in Tizé in France are, are, are making their daily prayer um, service available and it's at 1130 our time or you can really in the morning but you can also you know play at any time that you want to so chanting fine is a very powerful discernment strategy um I, I i mentioned journaling before as a really essential practice really essential practice journaling is absolutely if i if you were going to pick one thing to start doing to support discernment i would say journal um, and then i i want to lift up all the spiritual disciplines uh, we talk about them at epiphany a lot worship um, which is like even not on Sunday, which hopefully many of you just were there or like me heading off to it. Um, fasting, tithing for a period of time, directly tithing for a period of time. I want to get offer you, I, I changed, my life changed dramatically when I started tithing 10%. And I, I tied 10% and it, I started it at a time when I didn't have enough money. And it was amazing to see what it did to my faith and what it did to my financial stability. It's remarkable. Tithing is a really powerful uh, spiritual practice. Um, pilgrimage, you might think, oh, I can't do a pilgrimage because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but you can actually do um, a pilgrimage in place. Um, you can actually do uh, a pilgrimage um, in, in this region. And if you're interested in that, let me know, cause I can help you figure out how to do a pilgrimage. Um, and Sabbath, of course, um, the really, a really important one as well. So that is, um, there's a whole framework for discernment that I, um, that we'll get to in the, um, in the small discernment group that's starting. If you would like to, so I'm sorry, I didn't have time for that today. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, please let me know, because even if the group isn't a good fit for you, I might be doing some other things uh, with this content, kind of content, and I welcome your, as your ministry leader of discernment, I always am interested in when people are interested in discernment. So um, so the group, again, is starting on um, on January 24th. If you're interested in joining, if, if I've already emailed you about it, I know that you're joining. If you haven't emailed me about it and you'd like to join the group, we do have some space. Um, and you can email me. I guess I better put my email address in here. So, um, sorry, Barbie. Yes, I did start talking fast again. So the group, the sermon group is starting January 24th. And we do have some space in the group. If you're interested in, interested in joining the group, the sermon group, then you can email me. Or if you have any questions about any of the um, content that we walked through today, or interested in the topic of discernment, but maybe the group is not a good fit for you, which is totally fine. Um, I, I welcome, I am your ministry leader of discernment at Epiphany, and I really wanna hear from you if there's anything that you wanna talk about in terms of discernment. So um, we are heading off to Epiphany to go to church, but I do have a couple more minutes if anyone has any questions. Is your discernment group in person? No, it's not, it's gonna be on Zoom. Yeah, we're going to, we, we might have one session where we're going to try to do, um, it's not, we're not going to be conversing in person, we're going to meet, if, 
if it's possible and if it's safe and we have to work on it, but there might be one session in March where we meet in the chapel and I hand out some materials and then people go to an individual room by themselves or there's been no one there for 24 hours. So there's no like possibility of catching coronavirus um, and then maybe come back and do some reflection, but we'd be distanced and masked and all that stuff. And that would just be one session, which would not be, which you wouldn't have to attend if you were nervous. So definitely it's a Zoom thing. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Yeah. Any other questions? I appreciate I appreciated um, your reading uh, something that Doyd had said, yeah. and um, the particularly noted "Do I dare?" The mm -hmm. climbing the pinnacle of a possibility. I wondered if there would be a way that all of us, if we'd like, to, to have that in a written form. Yeah, yeah. That's a great idea, Inez. Usually I do a handout for this class. Um, mm -hmm. The version, earlier versions I've done of this class, I tried to adapt it for Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, Ruthann, I don't know if you're still there, but is it possible for us to email the people who participated today um, about the handout for the discernment for this class? Because I'm happy to do it, Inez. I have your email, but I'm wondering if others might want to know the same. I'm happy to do that. So we'll figure that out. Oh, Vince had the idea of could I copy and paste into chat? Uh, the problem is getting it out of chat for people that don't have the strong tech skills. I think that's the challenge. So yeah, but we'll we'll figure out some way of getting that to you. Thank Any you. Other? Any other questions? My pleasure, Inez. Diana, I have a quick question. Well, thank you for this. This was wonderful, I thought. Um, but uh, when is the uh, the class that's starting after January? You said there might be another one later on in the year. Do you have a sense yeah. of when that would start? You know, it really, it kind of depends. It, the, the discernment groups always depend on interest um, and, and, uh, and to some degree, my availability. I was planning on doing one last fall and then my mom got ill, so I wasn't able to start it until January. But um, the moment when, as soon as I have three people, I start a group because what I found is that once I have three, then I usually end up with 10. <laughs> so uh, 10 or 12. And it just that's just how the pattern works. So I think it's it's partly dependent on interest. It's also dependent on um, it's also dependent on kind of how the pandemic unfolds and the close of the pandemic. Because um, when Doid and Ruthann and I were talking about this, I think there is gonna be, we know we have noticed a lot of change. People in the pandemic, the, a lot of people have moved and changed and make decisions you know, quickly. And, and I think that when the pandemic ends, we're gonna be in that same pivot point, hinge point, right? Where people are trying to figure that out. So, so maybe the summer, maybe the fall, maybe late spring, I am not sure. And, but if you're interested, um, anybody, please contact me. Cause I, I can just keep your, uh, keep you on a list. And if it's, and once I have enough people and I'll be, and my, t my schedule lines up as well, we'll, um, I'll, I'll get in touch. So I'm would interested. you, I'm would you, would you please say your email? So those of us that would like to contact you can. Yes, it's in the chat as well. So it's my name, D-I-A-N-A, -A, Diana, dot Bender, B as in boy, E-N-D-E-R, at Outbook, O-U-T, L O O K dot com C O M. Thank you. Diana dot Bender at Outlook dot com. Well, it has been such a joy to be with all of you today. I love talking about this and thank you for your energy through the little cameras. I really appreciate it. Um, we are heading off to church now so that we um, aren't late, but again, please stay in touch and let me know if there's anything I can do to help. And if you'd like to join the January 24th group, please let me know as soon as you can. So, and Jen, and for those of you who said already, I look forward to being with you guys on January 24th. I'll send you a Zoom link and uh, look forward to um, this whole experience. Be well, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.